Okie dokie. All right, hello everyone and welcome to today's seminar. Uh, today we will be continuing our set of uh, Python seminars slash tutorials. And today I'm happy to have uh, John Hadusik here with us who will be discussing interfacing Python with co compiled languages. So John got his PhD in 2018 from the University of Mich Michigan focusing on MHD modeling of substorms. He then moved to the Naval Research Lab and is now working on the assimilation of ionospheric data and the SAMI-3 ionospheric model. I'm happy to have John here with us today. And John, if you'd like to take it away. Thank you, Kyle. So in this seminar, I'm going to be talking about uh, different ways to call compiled functions from uh, compiled, that is, things that are written in C or Fortran or some anything else that compiles to machine code. Uh, how to compile uh, or how to call those functions from Python. Um, so here's a quick overview of what I'm going to discuss. Uh, I'll have some introductory slides where I talk about what the scope of this talk is, uh, why you would want to, to uh, do this kind of thing, interfacing Python with these other languages, and also, uh, and then I'll talk in, in general terms what uh, what people do to uh, what what kinds of things are needed in order to bridge between languages. And then I'll give some specific examples of how you interface Python with uh, C and Fortran. So what I hope you'll get from this talk, if you're a C or Fortran programmer, you should learn some options for wrapping your existing code with Python. And if you're new to compiled languages, unfortunately, I'm not gonna be able to teach you how to write C and Fortran in a one hour seminar, but uh, you should be able to get a basic picture of how Python interacts with other software. And you'll get to be able to see what undergirds popular libraries like SciPy and NumPy. And um, so next, why would you want to wrap compiled code and call it from Python? Why don't you just write everything in Python? Um, the first reason is performance. Pure Python code tends to be about 100 times slower than compiled languages like C or Fortran. And uh, you can, you don't have to write C or Fortran code directly in order to get better performance uh, because you can use libraries like SciPy and NumPy to speed things up. But um, the reason that we're able to get better performance when we're using things like, uh, when we're using SciPy and NumPy is because SciPy and NumPy, a large portion of them are actually written in C and Fortran. And so the, the reason we get better performance with them is in large part because we're using C and Fortran code rather than just Python when, when we leverage those libraries. Um, but besides performance, there's a lot of other reasons you might want to bridge Python to other languages uh, because the whole rest of the software world is not all written in Python. Um, your operating system is probably written in C or perhaps in part C++. And if you want to, to create a graphical interface with your Python code, you're typically doing that by calling into some library that's written in C or C++ in order to do that. And in order to take advantage of these things, you don't necessarily have to write your own uh, wrapper for, for all of these things because people have already written Python wrappers for a lot of the popular GUI libraries and, and some of the other things you might want to interface with. Um, but uh, in space physics, we have, uh, we have sometimes specific codes that we want to interact with that are maybe custom written by, by a physicist or something and don't already have a wrapper. 
And so in the face, space physics world, there's a few use cases like that I can uh, that I can think of where you might want to do this. Uh, one is you wrote something in Python, and even after using SciPy and NumPy and trying to optimize that, you couldn't get the performance you wanted. And so then you rewrite the slowest parts of your code and see your Fortran. And this doesn't happen much because usually you can get a lot of, often you can get a lot of the performance you need by leveraging things like, like NumPy. But I have had a few encountered one case myself and and it, it probably comes up in other cases where if you're doing something fairly complicated uh in the in your solver loop or the the most uh the slowest part of your code rewriting it in c might be the thing you need um the other scenarios are not performance based but more capabilities related say you have an existing code that is written in c or fortran and you want to use some python package or feature with it for instance you want to draw some plots or you want to use numpy for pre and post processing or maybe take advantage of machine learning packages that are out there for python or maybe you just want to write to a reader write to files that are easier to do from python than from C or Fortran, then you might uh, create a bridge between your C code and Python in order to be able to do some of these things. And then finally, you, you might have a Python code already, and you found some C or Fortran code written by somebody else that you want to use with your Python code. So then you'd create a wrapper for it. And I know a couple of examples where people in space physics have done that. Uh, the Tsaigenyenko models, for instance, and the Geopack library, also written by Tsaigenyenko's group, um, are written, they're open source libraries that are written in Fortran. And at least a couple of groups that I know of have created Python wrappers for the Tsaigenyenko, Tsaigenyenko models and Geopack in order to excuse me, in order to be able to leverage those from Python. And also the SpacePy library, that, which is a Python package that a lot of you may have used, it comes with a, a library called Urbum, which is a, a Fortran code for radiation belt modeling. And they, and so SpacePy ships with Urbum and, it, and a Python wrapper for it, so you can leverage that from uh, from Python. But uh, this talk isn't talking about all the existing, uh, we're talking primarily about the existing uh, libraries out there that have already been wrapped for you, of which there are many. But uh, the focus of this talk is going to be how you go about creating a bridge from Python to one of these other codes that might already exist in C or Fortran so that you can so that you can call C and Fortran functions from your Python code. And there's three techniques that I'm going to talk about here that that are uh, that I found particularly useful for this. The first is the Python C API. It's the most basic, most direct way to interact with the Python interpreter. Uh, but it's complicated because it provides all of the capabilities you could want for interfacing with the Python interpreter. And it doesn't necessarily make it easy. Uh, you end up having to write a lot of C code uh, in order to create a bridge using the Python C API. Um, the next tool I'm going to talk about is Ftpy. And it, which is a Python to Fortran bridge that uh, it, that actually uses the C API, but it does a lot of the work for you. And um, the third technique is CFFI, that's C foreign function interface, and this creates a bridge at runtime, so you don't have 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 new C code that has to be compiled. You link to a previously compiled code. 
at runtime from the Python side, and then you can call functions from it. And these are by no means the only way to do it. Uh, there's several. Uh, there's a number of other ways to interface Python with other codes, and I've mentioned a couple here in this table. Uh, C types, Swig, which works not just with Python but with other languages like Perl and Ruby, that you can create wrappers for C code uh, to be able to interface them. And uh, and Boost.Python is easier than the Python C API, but it only works with C++, unfortunately. So definite pros and cons to that one. And finally, if, if it's the passive path of least resistance for what you're trying to do to just take your C executable, write a file out to disk and read it in from Python and maybe create a wrapper script that runs your C executable, and then reads whatever output it wrote. That's absolutely a viable way to leverage C and Python together. And I'm not gonna go into detail about how to do that, but but I will say there's no shame in doing it that way. It's often the, for a lot of problems, it's the best way or the most convenient way. And if you, and the performance hit is sometimes significant, but not always depending on what you're trying to do um but in this talk i'm going to focus on how you interface python with these other languages at the binary level while they're at runtime without writing things out to disk in between and generally to do that you need what's called a application binary interface and that is a uh, standard that defines how function calls are represented in machine code. And it also defines fundamental data types that are passed through function calls. And C is the only language that has a fully standardized ABI uh, on, on a majority of platforms. There's uh, on some platforms, there's a degree of standardization with C++. Uh, but uh, C is the language that has the most standardization as far as the ABI is concerned. And as a result, C has become kind of a lingua franca for bridges between programming languages. And this doesn't mean that you have to write C code in order to bridge between programming languages, but it does mean that uh, any interface between languages usually has to adhere to the C ABI. And um, a lot of languages provide built-in features for doing that. So for instance, if you're writing C++, you, you might have a function declaration like this that is valid both in C, C and in C++, but if you compile it in a C++ compiler, you'll get something slightly different uh, than what you would with a C compiler. And if you wrap it in extern C, then that'll turn off C++ name mangling and other things that, uh, and, and make sure that the, that the function is callable from C after it's been compiled by a C++ compiler. And uh, if, in, if you're doing fancier things like passing C++ instances of C++ classes or calling class member functions, then you have to do some additional wrapping, but but putting extra in C around your function declaration at the at the most basic level is what you need to do in C++. Now Fortran, since Fortran 2003, also has a way to generate functions that comply with the C ABI. And so this is an example of how to do that. So this is the same C function that you saw on the previous slide. And this is the Fortran equivalent way of declaring that same function. And so we've added this bind C directive at the end of our function declaration. And that turns off name mangling in the Fortran compiler so that the function will be callable from C. And we also are using this ISO C binding uh, module, which is 
the the other limitation with with if you want to make a C interoperable function in Fortran is you have to have it accept only C compatible data types. And so, and all of those are declared in the intrinsic module called ISO C binding. So we're using, we're taking the C int type, which is the equivalent of the int type in C. And the other thing is if you have things that are passed by value, or by uh, that you want to pass by value, which is the default in C, but Fortran by default passes by reference, you can actually pass things by value in Fortran just by adding the value attribute to your variable declaration. So, so that's how it works from C and Fortran to interface, C++ and Fortran to interface with C. What do you do in Python to, to talk to the C ABI? Well, interpreted languages, including Python, basically have two options. The first is you provide a C API that enables C programmers to C programs to interact with the interpreter, and that uh, and uh, the second is provide a foreign function interface that lets Python programs or or whatever interpreted language you're working with lets the lets your interpreted code load a C library and call functions from it. And Python provides ways to do both of these. And so the rest of this talk is going to be specific examples of techniques that are available for interfacing Python to C and Fortran and, and how to use those techniques. And all of the code I'm going to show is from this uh, Git repository, which uh, I'm going to paste into the chat here in case anybody wants to look at it. And this, uh, unfortunately, unlike the most of the other talks that you've seen in this Python series, I'm not going to be able to use Jupyter because I haven't found a way to run C and Fortran compilers from inside of Jupyter uh, to be able to uh demonstrate things for for you here so what i'm going to do instead is i'm going to have i'm going to run everything from a uh, unix uh, terminal window uh, to demonstrate things and if you want to build and run the examples here you'll need the following uh first of course python you'll also need numpy uh and then C and Fortran compilers. Uh, the only ones I've tested with my examples are GCC and G Fortran. It may well work with other compilers, but I haven't tried them. Um, and on Linux, you can install those with the package manager like apt or DNF or brew, or, or, brew if you're on Mac OS. And on Windows, I'm told that you can install compilers using Anaconda. And and uh, that should, since the Anaconda is a Python distribution, it should put the compilers somewhere that that the Python tools should be able to find them. Uh, and then a couple of the examples also use CMake, which is the build system that is used for building things, particularly in C and Fortran. Um, so. Moving forward, the first uh, the first uh, example I'm going to show, or the first couple of examples, use the Python C API, and here's these links here go to where the documentation is for this, and uh, if and so the Python C API enables you to create Python extension model modules that you can load in the Python interpreter the same way as, as a pure Python package. And you can also, I'm not gonna show how to do this, but you can also embed Python in an application and run a Python interpreter from inside of your C code. Um, and 
so I'm going to now switch to another screen here so that uh, I can demonstrate how to use this. And so this folder here is the top level of um, of the Git repository that I sent the link to, sent, put the link to in the chat a couple minutes ago. And I'm going to go into this folder called Python C API. And the second example here is called pass return double. And we'll CD into that folder in the shell here. And inside of this example, I've got a file called square.c. And square.c contains this function that I'm going to wrap from, so it can be called from Python. And this is a very simple C function. It just takes a number, double means that it's a double precision floating point number. So it takes a number called input, squares it, and then returns the result. And so in order to wrap this from Python, first we import the Python header. And then we create a wrapper function for this function for our C function that can be called from Python. And the way this wrapper function works is it takes a couple of pointers to objects of type pi object. And this is a this is this the same interface that you use for any function that's going to be callable from Python. On the C side, it takes these two pi object pointers. And the first thing we do is we take this args pointer, which contains the arguments that were passed to the function, and we need to parse that into something that's meaningful from the C side. So we call this pi arg parse tuple function and tell it that we're looking for a double by giving this, this string d. And then we pass it this a pointer to this variable called input that is going to store the the number that was passed to the python function and at this point we have a double we can pass it to our square function and then store the result in a variable called output and then to return it we have to convert it into some into a python type which we do with pyfloat from double and so now we have a function that's callable from Python, we now have to tell the Python interpreter about it. And so the rest of this is creating a module called square, putting our square function inside of that Python module, and then we initialize the module at the bottom. And so this is just a C file. And so we could compile this with a shared library directly using the compiler using command line switches that tell the compiler where the Python library is that it has to link to and how to how to find the Python header. But what I'm going to do instead is ah, we've got a question in the chat here. Can the I, can the API handle implicit type promotions? If you give a C function a non-double argument when a double is expected, that the value will be implicitly converted to a double in C. Does this happen if you're calling from Python? Uh, yes, I believe it does, uh, at least for the case I'm showing. Um, and in fact, I've got test code. Yeah, so in, in the test code that I'm going to run in, in a minute, you see what that I'm actually passing an, an integer to the square function, and it is implicitly promoting it to a a type because it will get a it will get a a, a real number back uh, after we call it. So yes, you it, it it can do implicit type promotions. Uh, there are being C, there are probably some caveats to that, and I. Can't claim to know all of them, but uh, but in general, the answer is yes. You it 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 will do that. Um. So so here's our setup.py. So this saves us from directly calling the, the in, directly uh, using the compiler and having to figure out the right path to the Python header files and all that. Um, 
we're going to go. So this is we're importing from disutils as if you're if you've made Python packages before, you've probably written a setup.py function yourself that looks somewhat like this, except instead of just importing setup, we're also importing a class called extension. And extension represents a, a uh, binary extension module that was compiled, say, with C. And uh, to create, so when we when we declare our extension object, we're going to pass it the source file square.c, so it knows that that's what it what it needs to build. And so then to install the package that we've created here, we just have to run Python setup.py install, and this is the same way you would for a pure Python package. And we we run this script, and it goes and uh, compiles our um, compiles our extension module that we wrote in C and installs it somewhere that the Python interpreter can find it. And you can actually, if uh, if you prefer to use pip, you can use pip the same way that to run the install script the same way that you would with uh, with any other setup.py function. And this is probably this this is actually the way I'd recommend because if you have any external dependencies, uh, Python modules that you depend on, uh, pip, you can declare those in your setup function and pip will automatically go find them and download and install them for you. So now that we've, uh, now that we've compiled and installed our extension module, we can then run this test square script that I've written. And all it does is it imports the square module that we declared, calls the square function, and checks the output uh, to make sure it produced the correct value. And so I run this, and it says success y equals four. Um, so we know now that our function uh, is working correctly. But this example, of course, was pretty simple. And one of the things that makes it perhaps a little bit too simple for space physics applications is the function just took a single number and did something with it. And of course, a lot of times we're working with large amounts of data as physicists and they're living in arrays instead of scalars. So I'm going to CD into my other folder that has an example of how to pass a numpy array to a uh, c function and so this is so in this folder i've got another file still called square.c and like the previous example we're importing the python header but we're also importing the numpy headers and actually i should jump over to, to the slides real quick. Uh, so, oh, whoops, let's, there we go. So, so now we can use the num, so in addition to the Python C, C API, NumPy provides its own C API that you can use to, uh, Stop that. That that you can use to um, call uh, that that you can use to create extension modules, and so NumPy adds the ability to interact with NumPy data types from your C extension modules, and so these two links here that I'm pasting into the chat provide. Uh, documentation and a tutorial on how to use the NumPy C API. Uh, and I've got my own example here that I'm gonna show you jumping over to my other screen here. We'll CD into the NumPy folder. And as I said, 
we're starting, we've added a couple of additional headers and these are bringing in the, the NumPy type declarations that we need in order to work with the NumPy API. And the function that I'm gonna wrap is a little more complicated. Instead of taking just a scalar, it takes pointers to arrays of doubles. And it also takes an integer representing the length of the array. And so what it does is it loops over this input array, squares each element and stores it in the corresponding element of the output array that was passed to it. And so we're going, as before, we're going to create a Python wrapper function for this. And our wrapper has the same signature as previously. It takes two pi objects. The second one contains the arguments that were passed. And this time, instead of casting to a double right away, we're going to interpret the input as just a generic pi object. And we're hoping that whatever was passed to this function is we're expecting that whatever was passed to this function is something that can be converted into a numpy array and we in order to pass to in order to work with this function here the array has to be contiguous in memory because we're just looping over array elements and assuming that they're all next to each other in memory um so we, not, we need to make sure that our NumPy array meets that requirement. And so we're gonna call this pi array from OTF function and pass it NPy double and NPy array and array. And those attributes tell it that, tell it to create a NumPy array from whatever was passed in, it's gonna create a NumPy array of type double and make sure that it's contiguous in memory. And if what was passed in was already already met those requirements, it's not going to do much uh, other than change the type on the C side. If you passed in a list, then it's going to convert it into a NumPy array for you. Um, now, but now that we have a NumPy array, we can then find out what its dimensions are, find out what its uh, shape and length are. And then we can create an output array that has the same type and dimensionality as our input array. And finally, we're going to get pointers to the data that's inside of those two NumPy arrays. And now we have two double pointers and an integer that we got from, from the length. And we can pass all of that into our square function. And then at this point, our output array is already a, um, is all, our output data is already living in this uh, NumPy array that we created up on this line where we, where we instantiated a new output array. And, and the square function is operating on its data pointer. So, its underlying data should all be up to date and we can just return that from the uh, return that to the caller but there's one thing we have to do first is, and that is that we created these new uh objects on the python side and only one of them is getting uh, using the python c api and only one of them is uh actually getting returned so we have to decrement its reference counter so that the uh, Python interpreter will destroy it like it's supposed to. Uh, otherwise, we'll get a memory leak. Um, so there's a few subtleties that you have to deal with uh, on the C side as far as keeping track of reference counters. Um, but uh, the rest of this function is actually very similar to the, the the rest of this file is very similar to the previous example where we're creating a extension module and then instantiating it so the python interpreter can use it our setup.py for this array example is actually 
almost identical to the previous example. The only difference is that instead of an importing from disutils.core like we did before, we're importing from numpy.disutils.core and it contains a setup function and an, an extension type, but the extension type in numpy.disutils.core knows about the numpy API and will link your code to it when it compiles it. And so then we can run this square function that uh, is going to pass it, that or the square test script that is going to import our extension module, pass in a numpy array, check the output, similar to what we did in the previous example. So first I'm gonna go install the setup script using pip. And then we'll go ahead and run that test script. And we see that it took this uh, input array and squared each element, just like we expected. So that's it for the NumPy API. But seeing these examples, there's probably two critiques that may come to your mind. One is this sounded like a lot of work, uh, writing all of this C code to wrap a, a really very simple C function so it can be callable from Python. And two, you might say that, oh, my code isn't in C, it's in Fortran. And of course you could use the Python C API to write a C wrapper function for your, write a C wrapper function for your Fortran function, call it using the Python C API and create a bridge to your Fortran code that way. And depending on what you're doing, that may be necessary, but there's an easier way if you're working with Fortran and that is use F2Py. And F2Py is a tool that ships with NumPy. And what F2Py does is it reads your, um, it reads your, Fortran code looks for procedures in your Fortran code that it can wrap, generates C wrapper code for it, compiles the wrapper code in your Fortran code, links them together into a Python extension module that you can then call from Python. And I'm going to paste into a chat into the chat the link to the uh, F2Py documentation. And then I'm gonna go over to the other screen and we're going to CD into the F2Py folder and I'm gonna move my editor over to the F2Py folder. And we've got a, again, an array and a scalar example. I'll open the scalar example and we've got a function that we wanna wrap. So this Fortran file, first declares a Fortran module and inside of that Fortran module is a single function called square. This is very similar to the square function that we had in C where it takes an input, it squares it and it create, it has an output variable and it squares the input, stores it in the output. And so to use this, uh, so, so to use this using F2Py, you, one way to do it is to just use the F2Py command line tool where you just run F2Py minus M here is, tells it to create a uh, Python module called square and minus C square dot F90 tells F2Py that you have a, Fortran file called square.f90 that it should compile and create an extension module for. <laughs> and so if I run this, it's then going to take the G Fortran, Fortran compiler and then and compile the module and and it spits out a it, it spits out a nice little uh, if I resize my window so you can read the file name, it spits out this nice little library file which does in fact contain a uh, a python wrapper for our square for our square fortran function 
But you might be wondering, well, what all happened when we did this? Uh, and a way to find out is you pass f to pi the builder option, which tells it to preserve the temporary directory that it created and then deleted in the background while it was compiling your code. And so if I run it with builder, tell it to put its output in a folder called f to pi build. Now I open that folder and there's all these C Fortran and, and C header files. And so these two Fortran object files are actually the are actually things that were copied from the NumPy distribution. Uh, and these two are new that were just generated by f to pi. So if we open this one, this is a very simple Fortran file that uh, doesn't seem to be having a whole lot going on there, but it looks like it's creating some sort of wrapper for our uh, for for our Fortran function. If we look in the C the C Fortfunks module dot C, this is where the real meat of things is going on. So f to pi generated this file, and we see that it includes the Python header. It also includes Fortran object.h, which comes with NumPy. And we've got uh, all kinds of stuff going on. I'm not going to pretend to understand all of it, but I will note that we have some Py objects in here. So we're clearly using the Python C API in whatever, in all the things we're doing here in this wrapper. And so, so f to pi has compiled this all into an extension module for us. And probably you would like to have your extension module installed somewhere instead of just living in the build directory. Um, and as before, we can do that using a setup.py script. Again, we're use, we're importing from numpy.disutils.core. And in, in addition to knowing about the numpy C API, uh, the numpy disutils tools also know about Fortran sources. So we can just create an extension module, put a Fortran source file name in the sources attribute to that extension module, and our our NumPy enabled setup.py will use f to pi to call that. And so now if I run pip install dot, it builds and installs as before. And if we now go into our, I've got a test square script that looks basically identical to the C scalar example, except that we're importing, except the import statement is slightly different. And so if we run this test script again, we see that we've got Fortran code getting called from the uh, called from the Python interpreter. Now, uh, one thing with f to pi that I'm not going to demo because it's so simple is that if your um, if your Fortran function contains arrays in its declaration, as this one does here, f to pi just handles the arrays for you, and you don't have to do anything special uh, to uh, to uh, to wrap them. You just have arrays in your um, in your procedure declaration on the Fortran side, and f to pi will create the appropriate uh, Python wrapper for it. So that's almost it for f to pi. One more thing that I'm going to mention with f to pi is there's a big caveat with f to pi, and that is, as far as I can tell, f to pi makes no use of that ISO C binding and bind C directives that I mentioned at the beginning when I talked about how to create C ABI functions from Fortran. And what this means is that uh, f to pi is probably using older techniques for wrapping Fortran code from C. And those techniques involve making assumptions about how the 
Fortran compiler converts your Fortran code to machine code and how it handles function calls. And those assumptions are, le are leveraging the fact that a lot of compilers do things kind of the same way, but there's nothing in the Fortran standard that, that says they have to. And so if those assumptions are wrong, you'll you'll end up with a wrapper that doesn't work correctly. I've never actually encountered problems because of this in my use of f pi but it certainly could happen depending on what Fortran compiler you're using and, and what you're doing with it. Uh, there's a question in the chat. Is there a way to square a variable without creating an extra copy in memory on the right-hand side? Um, in general, yes. Uh, how you do it would depend on which which of the APIs you're using and how you're using them. Uh, but it, but in general, that that should be possible. So the last thing that I'm going to talk about is how to use the CFFI package which provides you the ability if you already have code that's that you've compiled to a shared library you can actually just load that shared library at runtime from python and call call functions from it and cffi is based on libffi which is a c library and um it's uh, and so that uh, so I've pasted a link to the C to the FFI documentation and then the CFFI documentation down here. I'll also copy the link into the chat for you. Um, and so CFFI provides a way to load libraries at runtime and call functions inside of them. And so here I'm going to switch to my other screen to demo this. We'll CD into the CFFI pass double folder, and I'll go up to the same folder in my in my editor and resize this window so you can see the right side of the editor screen. So going into the past double folder, I've got two functions that I've created wrappers for. The first is the C function er, er, that I'm going to create wrappers for. The first is a C function that is the same C function that we wrapped in the first example using the Python C API. And the second is an actually identical function, but implemented in Fortran. And so what we're going to do is first, I'm going to compile these two functions into shared uh, libraries. So I've got this uh, CMake build file that uh, creates one library called square that uses, that, that is built from the square.c file a second one that's built but from the square.f90 file and and then it's also going to create our take our python wrapper script and copy it to the build directory just for convenience and so i'm go going to go ahead and create a build directory cd into it and then once we're in the build directory if you if you have used CMake before, you know that with CMake, you run the CMake command and give pass it a, the path to your source directory, which in this case is just the parent directory. So I give it two dots for that. Press enter, and CMake is going to go and detect what C and Fortran compilers I I have installed and make sure that they work. And now I can just type make and CMake will build my two shared library files. And you notice they have extensions .dilib because I'm on a Mac and that's the default library extension on Mac OS. And if, I, if you run this uh, build on Linux, it'll generate .so files and on Windows, it'll, they'll be .dll's. And 
So the first thing we do in our uh, Python code is we go and figure out what the name of our library file is. And so, so then we can load it and have the right extension based on what platform we're on. And so then I've got this load lib function that calls that get shared lib extension function. Uh, but first what it does is import the CFFI library uh, package. And then it's going to call this cdef function, which has a little snippet of C code that's just the function declaration so that CFFI knows that there is a function that I'm going to be calling and what signature it has. And then I'm actually going to load the library using CFFI. And then we'll return it from our function so we can use it. And to actually call it, we just do lib.square and the square being the name of our function and, and pass whatever arguments we want. Um, and so in the main section of this uh, of this Python file, I'm looping over the names of those two library files and loading each library file and checking to make sure it works. So if I then run square wrapper.py, we see it says success s equals four. And so that's it for passing scalars to CF through CFFI. Um, but of course, you probably want to work with an array. And so I've got another example that uses an array. This is the same the, the same function we wrapped using the NumPy API, the Fortran equivalent to that. And our square wrapper has the same get shared lib extension function at the top. Load lib is the same except the function declaration here is has been updated to match the signature that uh, the to match the signature of our uh, of our actual function that we're using. And um, then uh, where we have to do something interesting is in when we actually call the square function, we have to make sure again that the thing we're passing into it is a pointer to a double precision array of numbers and not something else. So we take our input variable and convert it into a NumPy contiguous array using np.as contiguous array. And that'll get us a, contigu a contiguous array of double precision floating point numbers. We create an output array that has the same uh, the same size and shape as the input. And then we grab data pointers from each of them, pass it to our square function as before because we work because we were operating on the underlying data pointer or output data or output variable should already be up to date and we can return it. And so again, we can go and uh, go to our other folder, go ahead and build it. And I'm just collapsing this onto one line for convenience, but it's essentially the same build process as before. And then we can run our wrapper and it seems to be working. So that's it for CFFI, and that's actually it for the talk as well. There's lots of other things that that you can do because I haven't gotten, for instance, into how you go back the other way and uh, call C call C and Fortran functions from Python, which there are ways to do that. I haven't gone into how to run an embedded interpreter inside of your C code, which is also possible, but at this point, I'll wrap it up and see if there's any questions. And then this closing slide just has uh, copies of all of the uh, URLs that I've displayed uh, uh, so you can get any uh, look to any of those for reference if you want to learn more about uh, how to do these things.
So at this point, I'll just see if there's any more uh, questions that people have. Hi, right, thanks, John. Um, well, I think Eric is clapping or waving. Uh, I had a quick question. Um, you had these slides available. On, you had the slides available online. Are you able to share that so that people can follow along the slides? Yes, I can. I've uh, the the online version is actually a little bit out out uh, is not currently up to date with uh, what was not currently up to date with what I was showing in the presentation here. But if I go to my other Firefox window, unless you, Kyle, have the URL handier than I do. I might be able to grab it quick, yep. OK. Uh, yes, here we go. All right, so those are just in the chat for everyone. Um, I will also post them on the YouTube. Um, you covered a lot of uh, ground today and a fairly complicated task. Um, so the seminar will be up on YouTube as soon as we finish today for those that might want to go back and review a few things. Um, and I will have these slides posted to the YouTube as well so that people can follow along in the slides and copy and paste. Um, and I believe I also have the GitHub repository. No, that. Yeah, I think I already pasted that into the chat, but we can we can put that into there. We can paste that again at the bottom here. Yeah, yeah there, there I go. think I got it there. Yep. Um, all right. Uh, so if we don't have any questions, uh, thank you again, John, for taking on this fairly big task and walking everyone through how to uh, interface Python with uh, Fortran and C. Thank you, Kyle. I uh, hope everyone has a wonderful week. Uh, next week, we have Paul O'Brien speaking, and he'll be talking about looking at the drift phase of radiation belt electrons and how, what that phase can tell us about radiation belt electron acceleration and transport. Uh, so I hope everyone has a good week. Bye.